Ratchet and Clank as a series is something that I've never properly experienced. Not because I don't like the games or anything like that, but because I've never really gotten around to playing them. They just kinda passed me by. The only game in this series that I've ever spent any time with was the 2016 PS4 remake of the 2002 original, which was on the PS2. I actually did finish that game and I enjoyed it quite a lot. And that leads me to an important realization that I had. If I hadn't taken the time to play that remake, I honestly don't know if I would have even considered picking up the newest game in the series. And with about one week to go before it released, I was still not sure, but in the end, I went for it and boy am I glad I did. This is my review of Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart. So let's get this out of the way before we get into the actual review. I currently have a channel goal of reaching 500 subscribers. So if you enjoy the video and want to help us get there, consider subscribing to the channel by clicking that little red button just below the video. It helps smaller channels like mine get seen by more people and I'd really, really appreciate it. So as usual in my reviews, we're going to talk about what the game is and what it's about, then move on to the things I liked, and then we'll go into the stuff I didn't like so much. And after that, I'll round things up and let you know what I think of it overall. And I should say, don't worry about spoilers as you'll only be seeing gameplay and cutscenes from the first two levels. The game also has three performance modes, which is 4K 30fps with ray tracing, 60fps with ray tracing and dynamic resolution, and lastly, the one that I used, which was 60fps without ray tracing at what I think is a steady 1080p. So then, what is Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart? Well, it's a third-person action-adventure platformer with quite a lot of third-person shooting and some very light RPG mechanics. It centers around two characters named Ratchet & Clank, unsurprisingly. Ratchet is a creature known as a Lombax, but he happens to be the last one of his kind, while Clank is a small robot who Ratchet first meets in the 2016 remake that I mentioned earlier. They've obviously formed their bond and friendship a long time ago, as there have been numerous games in this series along with spin-offs and mobile games, but if you're completely new to these games, I think you'll be fine anyway. During the opening section of the game, Ratchet and Clank are being honored as heroes in a huge parade which has been thrown for them, but that quickly goes south when Dr. Nefarious turns up and gets hold of a device that's capable of opening rifts to other dimensions. You start tearing through the parade trying to stop him while moving from epic set piece to epic set piece. So I guess the basic setup really without any spoilers is just that it's your job to stop him. Quite early on you'll also meet a female Lombax from a different dimension called Rivet who is just as capable as Ratchet, but that's mainly because unfortunately she's just a palette swap of her counterpart and has no special skills or anything that differentiates her at all from Ratchet in any way. They play exactly the same. Both characters do level up though and gain more health as they do. They also share all currency, weapons and weapon upgrades which I think narratively is a little bit strange but as a gameplay consideration I think it's perfectly fine. During the course of the game you'll be doing a lot of platforming and third person combat with a variety of weapons, some of which are rather strange but all definitely useful in their own way. There's plenty of things to smash for bolts which is the in-game currency and also for rare titanium and that's used to upgrade your weapons. There's also plenty of secret areas to find which often contain a golden bolt collectible or some sort of armor for your characters to wear. These armor pieces give you a small buff, like XP gains for example, even if you don't equip them. As far as I understand the system, you gain all the buffs of the gear that you've picked up, but then you can choose which one to actually wear to suit your taste. Equipping the piece does not grant you the buff, owning it does, which is an interesting way to do it, especially in a game like this that doesn't really need this system, I just think it's a cool addition. The game is generally a straightforward linear experience, although as I mentioned earlier, there are some side distractions like little pocket dimensions which are hidden around the various worlds you'll visit, and from my experience seem to be the main way for you to obtain new armor pieces. The levels on these worlds usually have a point A to point B type progression, but there are small deviances and sometimes you can choose which world you'd like to clear first, but it's usually only a choice between the two worlds which ultimately need to be completed one after the other, regardless of which one you choose to do first. So now you know what the game is, what it's about, and what it does, so let's talk positives. I think the absolute, inarguable main selling point of this game is its incredible visual quality. It is honestly just stunning to look at, everything is so detailed and so dense. Now granted, a lot of it is just background stuff, and in some games it doesn't really mean much. Here though, in Rift Apart, it really adds to the epic feeling of each and every world you visit. Can you explore it all? Well, no, no, you can't. Does it matter though? I, I don't think so. The artist's and designer's goal here was to give you a sense of place, a sense of 
being small, you know, in a huge world. And they easily achieve that here in my personal opinion. If you're somebody who feels that window dressing is just that, window dressing, and nothing more, then I think that's a fair position to take. I'm just going on how the game made me feel as a player when I personally played it. Some people out there have claimed that this is the best looking game ever made, period. That includes PS5, Series X, and PC games. For me, having completed the game and seen basically everything it has to offer visually, it's kinda hard to argue that. The textures are all very high resolution, the environments, the lighting, they're all virtually perfect in most cases, and the character models and animation are probably some of the best you could ever ask for in a video game. The sections where a whole new map just loads instantly and you travel between various dimensions in the blink of an eye is quite frankly one of the most jaw-dropping things that I've ever seen in a video game. The PS5 super fast SSD is really putting in some work for this game. So do I want to say that it is the best? Sort of, because it does look incredible. But I do think with it being similar to a Disney Pixar film in its style, it may be easier to get away with something like that when compared to trying to make realistic looking people. I mean, I guess only time will tell, but for me, for now, this is certainly one of the best looking games of all time. I don't know if it's the best, but it's definitely one of the best. So the second major positive for this game is the combat. I found it really enjoyable. It's very hectic and there's always so much going on with enemies breaking apart, projectiles coming from all sides, and particle effects for days. But having said all that, it never feels overwhelming or like you'll just get swarmed and killed instantly. Sounds kind of cliche to say, I guess, but there just is a lot of method in this madness. The weapon wheel, which you can access by holding down triangle, stops time and lets you swap to whichever weapon you want to use in a given situation. You can choose to play as a standard third-person shooter by just using, you know, auto-rifle and shotgun-style weapons, or you can make things weird by summoning little mushrooms with guns to shoot your enemies for you, or hatch a bunch of tiny little robot dinosaurs to chomp at their legs. It really is up to you how you want to play. All the weapons have tons and tons of upgrades, which are all very slight until you purchase every Everything around the yellow nodes, which then unlocks a more significant upgrade. You can of course jump and double jump, which is great for platforming sections or for dodging enemy fire, as well as a dash, which I think has some invincibility frames to it, which sometimes really comes in handy. Combat overall is just very fun and chaotic. During even the most intense fights, I didn't experience any frame drops or sluggishness in the game at all. It was basically rock solid the entire time, and besides the visuals, it really is the highlight of this game. I've never been really much of a sound guy, but everything I heard in this game was basically top-notch as far as I could tell. And that includes the voice acting for virtually every character, the facial animations, especially their eyes, were very good at conveying emotion and honestly there were times when I was watching their eyes and I could kind of tell how they felt, which is weird when you consider that it's just animated pixels on a 3D model. It's kind of weird when you realize that. Other than that, the platforming sections were enjoyable, but that kind of gameplay has never really been my thing, although I have no problem with it. I'm just sort of indifferent to platformers. But here it's perfectly fine and does what it needs to do. I actually really enjoyed the rail grinding sections, which really took me back to the Sonic Adventure games, which I really do love. So with all of the main positives out of the way, which make up virtually the entire game, this section will be short, as there isn't really much to mark it down for. You could even call these nitpicks realistically, as they won't ruin the game in any way except perhaps for the last point, but we'll get to that. So I encountered my first glitch around 10 minutes into the game in the first level, and I got stuck inside a wall. I tried to attack the thing that was in front of this wall, and it just kind of went forward and went into the wall and I couldn't get out. I had to do a checkpoint restart, which was fine because it only put me back around 15 to 20 seconds. This really isn't a deal breaker in any way. These kinds of things are almost impossible to stop completely in game development. They happen all the time and I don't blame the game at all for this. It did happen another two times in later levels, but I was able to get free from those without a restart, so it really isn't a big deal. It's, it's just something I thought I'd mention, but the checkpoint system is pretty generous, so you should be fine regardless. One thing I did notice was that there was a lot of places throughout the game where the character would just seem to get stuck on nothing, and I think this occurs in games when pieces of geometry are joined together during development. Just remember getting snagged on what seemed like nothing relatively often, and I'm not talking constantly, but you know, like once every now and then. I would just be running forward on what looked like flat ground just to get snagged on something that didn't seem to be there. It's kind of weird, but 
I don't think it's a big deal in any way, shape or form. I also had some minor visual glitches where the camera would clip into a character's body or a bit of scenery during a cutscene so I couldn't really see what was going on. That was a little bit strange. And later in the game there was also some weird pixelization effects in the green dome on the top of the head of Dr. Nefarious and that was in cutscenes only so again it's all very minor stuff but I thought it was worth mentioning. The game periodically puts you in situations where you play as Clank and you have to do some puzzles. These are mandatory and part of the story. I've never really been keen on puzzles in games. I just kind of find them boring. It's actually what made me stop playing Immortals Phoenix Rising completely. I would much prefer just a combat challenge or something along those lines, but I'm not going to mark the game down for that because that's a personal thing. It's not the game's fault that I don't like puzzles, but I think it's worth mentioning as it does make you do them. I think you had to do it maybe five times across the entire campaign, maybe six. Each of those times consisted of three puzzles within each time though, so there is quite a few, but they aren't really difficult or anything. I just thought people should be aware that they do make you do them. There's also some hacking sections where you play as a little spider bot that has to shoot viruses to clean out a system. And again, I believe that most of these are mandatory except perhaps the last one, but they do progress the story and you have to do them in certain situations. And I think the spider bot has probably the only voice in the entire game that I found in any way annoying. Again though, it's not a deal breaker, it's just a, a me thing, so I don't think it's anything to worry about. So this final section will include both the final negative point and the conclusion all kind of wrapped into one. The final and only real negative that this game has for me is its price. And I know, I know, I mention price in all my reviews and in other videos as well, but it's relevant. It's definitely relevant. There are so many people out there, millions in fact, that can only buy, say, one game a month, or one game every two months, or maybe even less than that, or whatever the case may be. This game is supposed to be £70 in the UK, and also $70 in the US. That means we pay, in the UK, the equivalent of about $99 US dollars for this game. When Sony's exclusives went up in price over here, they went from £50 to £70, while in the US they went from $60 to $70. I think the US has maybe some tax that you pay on top of that $70, but obviously not being from the US, I don't know how much or how that works. I don't know if you have to pay the $70 and then you add tax to that, I really, I just don't know how it works. So if I've got any American viewers, could you let me know in the comments below, I'd really appreciate that. But in the UK, our taxes are almost always included in the price we see, and that's the price we pay. So I personally paid £62 for my game instead of £70, due to where I bought it from online. And that would equate to me paying roughly around US$87 US dollars for it. And I finished my playthrough after beating the story and doing quite a good chunk of the side stuff in a playtime of roughly 12 hours. Now if you're somebody who has to choose one game a month or even for the next few months due to financial reasons or whatever, I feel like the price being asked is a bit too high. Of course value completely means different things to different people and I am definitely aware of that, but usually people tend to live within their means. But for me bumping the price up by £20, which by the way is about $28 increase, and giving us a 12 hour game no matter how pretty it looks is a little bit difficult to take. There's a whole argument and a whole nother video that could be made for Sony exclusive prices increasing and this really isn't the time for that, but suffice to say I don't think they've really delivered on giving us more value for the increased price. Sure the visuals are incredible and the game is great, but for the extra money they say that they need, I was expecting this game to have quite a bit more content, I was thinking this was going to be perhaps a 25 to 30 hour game, but it just isn't. So overall the gameplay is great. The visuals are just on another level, but the game lacks longevity and content. If you're someone who will replay the game over and over again, you know, New Game Plus, harder difficulties, then I think you could probably justify the asking price, as well as if you're a massive fan of this series in general. As I said earlier, value means different things to different people, but I'm just giving you my opinion and that's really all I can do. So if you're lucky enough to have a PS5 right now, I can 100% easily recommend this game as something you should look into playing, but keep the following stuff in mind. If you didn't like Ratchet & Clank games before, then even with the amazing visuals and the cool Rift stuff, this probably won't change your mind because it's basically a better looking Ratchet & Clank game. If you don't have a PS5 yet, I don't think this is really a system seller, but it would make a good game to perhaps get cheaper while bundled in with your console when they become more available, assuming that that store allows you to do that. 
if you own a PS5 and you're on the fence about this due to maybe not having played the series before and or the steep price, I would probably say wait for a sale unless you plan to buy the game, finish it in 12 to 15 hours and then sell it. I think if you were to go that route, then, you know, I could probably recommend it because it's definitely worth a playthrough. So if, as I said, you're going to buy it, complete it and then sell it, I think that's a perfectly fair approach to take. So there you go, that's my review of Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Remember to check out Pyro Games for some retro gaming goodness. There will be a link in the video description along with a discount code for 10% off your order. But with all that said, thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time.